So uh, the first point is that experiments measure configurations in which two bound nucleons have high relative momentum. This is a relatively recent thing which takes a lot of uh, experimental uh, efforts. Uh, imagine you shoot an uh, electron in at a nucleus, out comes the electron that has been scattered, as the exchange you refer to a photon, and uh, the aim is to have, have a, an experiment that, that can see correlated nucleons in the initial state. Uh, so let's say the photon hits a, a photon of momentum P, goes out with the momentum P plus Q, you measure a uh, a proton and a recoiling, uh, mainly it turns out to be neutron, and you can reconstruct the initial momentum of, of both pairs of both nucleons and the uh, angle between them, which is gamma. So you got to measure the electron, uh, the fast nucleon, and, and the recoiling one. And uh, so what experimentalists can measure is high relative momentum, and the high relative momentum is associated by the uncertainty principle with short distances. And uh, the first experiment of this kind uh, is over here. That, that was actually protons in and, uh, instead of electrons. We interested in, in the um, outgoing PN pair that was knocked out of the nucleus. And you see here a plot of uh, the number of counts as a function of, of P, which is the uh, momentum of the recoiling uh, nucleon. And uh, as a function of uh, more, more points in these higher, uh, more events, as a function of the cosine of gamma. And for high momentum, you see lots and lots of, uh, at high momentum, at which of the angles are large. And you can see this plotted in a different way here high relative momentum. Uh, you see uh, that the cosine of gamma tends to be large and negative. Uh, which corresponds to back to back in the uh, nucleus. And uh, lots of experiments have re reproduced these uh, earlier re results, and with, with, the result, with the result that uh, mainly 15 to 20 percent of nucleons are in a short range correlated pair. Now, uh, short relative distances correspond to short range correlations, and there's been some discussion of can you really measure short range correlation? The idea that people complain about is that uh, short range correlations are a property of wave functions, and wave functions can't be measured. And so, uh, in fact, uh, Swank and Bernstahl wrote uh, in fact, in 2010 a systematic framework for, uh, if needed to address questions whether short range correlations are important in, in nuclear structure. Uh, however, in fact, there are lots of examples in, in which momentum space wave functions are closely related to cross sections. If you look in the quantum mechanics book by, by Sakurai and now Sakurai and Palatano, uh, it shows that the photoabsorption cross section uh, on hydrogen, the photon comes in, breaks up hydrogens. Uh, that cross section is proportional to the square of the wave function. So effectively, you are measuring wave functions. And this technique has become more professionalized in great detail in condensed matter physics and has been used to uh, get uh, uh, electron wave functions in solids. And it's a big, big industry and in the review article. So, uh, in, in principle, wave functions actually can be determined, or at least important aspects of wave functions can be determined. And perhaps the only difference between atomic physics and nuclear physics is that the interactions, our interactions are more complicated. Uh, I will argue that there are certain simple features of the nuclear and nuclear interactions that make wave functions measurable, or at least the short range correlated part measurable. And I'll try to argue that short range correlations can be measured and that they're important in certain processes. And I'll give some examples and that the remainder of the talk. So I, I want to begin by, by, by contrasting a, a modern effective field theory with uh, nuclear physics. The standard thing about uh, effective field theory is that if there are parameters that are very large or very small, you make simpler approximations by selecting, setting large parameters to infinity and small parameters to zero. 
And then uh, you put in some finite effects of the large parameters, for example, in perturbation theory. An example is the low energy uh, weak interaction uh, where you treat W and Z in exchange uh, as a contact interaction. So effective field theory is defined uh, in the textbooks uh, using a scale separation. And uh, it would seem that large separations are needed for effective field theory to work. However, uh, in, in nuclear physics, all the scales are about the same. If you take a typical large nucleus of radius five Fermi, and the average separation distances between nuclear line is 1.7 Fermi, the range of interaction, which is approximately one over the pi on mass, which is the range of interaction, which is not very much larger than the nuclear on radius, all of these scales are the same. Uh, in the effective field theory sense, when things are within a factor of three, they're in the same order. So uh, there is no uh, scale, scale separation. And uh, I think there's interesting physics to be gained by treating all scales. So uh, the next step in this particular talk is that I want to do a quick review of nuclear nuclear scattering. I can argue that the basic features hit you in the face. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the one ion, ion exchange. Uh, so you have uh, here, imagine you're scattering in the center of mass. You can have uh, neutrons going forward and protons going forward and they just exchange a, 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 a phi zero. But you can also, in the center of mass, uh, exchange charged pions with a neutron becoming a proton and the proton becoming a neutron. So in the center of mass, uh, system forward scattering is actually backward scattering. And you'll see it, this is a plot from textbook uh, Preston and Maduri, as you go to high enough energies, uh, this is the cross section is a function of center of mass angle over here. And you see uh, this uh, forward backwards starting to have forward backward sy symmetry. Of course, that's not exact. There's other components to the interaction. But the manifestation of the one pion exchange is rather explicit. And the one pion exchange gives rise to short range correlations, the tensor part goes as one over the, the separation distance cubed, so that's a big effect. So uh, that's there, and you just see, you see it in the data without any uh, interpretation of the uh, needed. And the second thing, what about proton-proton scattering at the high energy, high energy in the nuclear physics sense? Uh, the, the data show or strongly indicate that there's some kind of short uh, range of propulsive core. And uh, again, uh, you see here a plot of cross section for different energies as a function of center of mass angles. And uh, at, at low energies, of course, the uh, distribution has to be isotropic because we have only x ray scattering. But as, we, as the energies increase, we still have basically isotropic scattering, except of course, Coulomb effect, give you forward picking. Uh, but other than that, you have isotropic scattering, and the isotropic can, cannot be due to only just S wave scattering because the energies are, are, are high enough. And uh, in, in, in early analysis by Jasper in 1951 uh, uh, found that the interference between S and D wave phase shifts gives, uh, gives the flatness. Uh, and that's shown here. Here you see the S wave uh, phase shift falling as a function of uh, energy. And the D waves coming in, the, the other D waves tend to average out, the other ones are not important. And uh, that made it possible to interpret the, the flatness of the cross section uh, in terms of the interference between uh, S and D waves as well as the D wave itself. And the interpretation was that there's sort of a hard repulsive of core at short distances and long range attraction. So uh, this again is a striking experimental feature, uh, this flatness. Uh, that uh, calls to be explained, and the data is hitting you right in the face. There's a quick summary of the nuclear nuclear scattering. Uh, the one pion exchange tensor support is very important for the deuteron and neutron proton scattering, and proton proton scattering is described by a semi hard core plus longer range to track the force. So the implication is that you have pairwise for forces between nucleons that bind nucleon. There's no central potential. Nucleon nucleon correlations exist, and now people know that there's also three body correlations. Um, 
And another uh, striking uh, feature of data uh, was discovered again in the 1950s. Uh, uh, they shot 95 MeV protons at a, car at a carbon nuclei and out came deuterons. And the idea is that just since we 95 kinetic energy, MeV, 95 MeV kinetic energy corresponds to about 400 MeV uh, over C momentum, which is rather large. And the proton can pick up a neutron and they go out together in the neutron. The neutron had to have this kind of momentum uh, in the initial state to be able to make a deuteron in the final state. So uh, the lesson is uh, down here. If the proton has high momentum, uh, the neutron in the nucleus must have high momentum to make a high momentum deuteron. This again is a striking experimental signature that hits you in the face and with little interpretation needed. Now I want to talk about the theory. Uh, I want to argue uh, that there must be uh, short range correlations in the nucleon nucleon force using uh, an argument based on the Lipnick Klinger equation that it's for S wave scattering at, at zero energy. Zero energy is important for nuclear bound states, so it's a good energy to look at. And then the Lipnick, you pick, write the Lipnick Klinger equation and, and, uh, for the wave function and then write its momentum space representation. You get an expression, you have the radial wave function, uh, uh, U of R uh, times the potential, which is a local potential, times the sine of the R, and you, really then, so you get a factor of uh, one over K cubed. K, K squared is coming from the kinetic energy, the one over K coming from the sine KR over K, which is the plane wave function. And you can make an asymptotic series in terms of K, for large K, by just uh, Writing the sine of KR is minus one over KD by DR cosine KR and integrating by parts. And you keep doing this in the first order. The first order term goes like one over K to the fourth. The next term goes away and then you get K to the sixth. The coefficients are the potential times the weight function is zero. Uh, the second derivative of that quantity and the fourth derivative. And uh, you get the point is that you get power law behavior uh, unless it uh, happens that, that the potential times the wave function vanishes at zero separation. And that doesn't happen for our potentials in nuclear physics. So uh, you have uh, power law fall off at high momenta. This corresponds to slow fall off, which means. That, there are, that, that uh, first of all, if there's a significant high momentum content, and secondly, uh, that uh, um, uh, there must be short range correlations because there's high momentum content. Uh, okay, then the next uh, things I, I want to do is to give uh, three examples of, of short range uh, short distance physics. The first is the uh, EMC effect, which is seen in uh, deep and elastic scattering from nuclei. And uh, the point is that the quark structure of the nucleon is modified in the nucleus. A typical thing to do is to plot uh, the cross section per nucleon divided by the deuteron cross section per nucleon. And in, in the simplest case, if the nucleon quark wave function, the quark wave function of the proton and neutron within the nucleus is not affected by uh, interactions in the nucleus, then this ratio should be flat. There's a correction. Uh, so this is the plot versus your pain X here. Here's the one. And the original expectation by experimentalists was that you'd see one, and then there's a Fermi motion correction coming in at high energy, at high X, because we know the nucleons are used to moving. But the data, in, in fact, shows this dip. Uh, that cannot be explained by ordinary nuclear physics. Thus, uh, we see that quarks indeed have a presence in nuclei. The quarks and protons are influenced by their interaction with the surrounding nucleons. Now, this effect is small. The way that people make these plots, it looks like it's a large effect, it's 10% or so, but it's in, this is, remember, a ratio, and, and both numerator and denominator are very, very small because it's at high x, where the uh, 
uh, court distribution functions uh, are getting pretty small. So this is a small probability thing. It doesn't affect the bulk of nuclear physics. No, nonetheless, it's, it's uh, a very interesting thing to see that the quarks are in the nucleus and doing something. And that uh, we should not uh, forget, we as nuclear physicists should not forget about this uh, aspect, especially as people press the precision frontier. Uh, second example, you can interrupt if you want to ask questions at any time. Uh, second example, uh, this is covered. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, this paper gave us the title, it gave me the title of, of this talk and long range uh, nuclear properties be influenced by short range interactions, uh, a chirodynamics estimate. So, uh, as I said, data show that 20% of nucleons or so are, are, are part of a short range correlated pair. And these, we found in this paper that these correlations influence uh, calculations of nuclear charge radii. The chiral dynamics uh, uh, refers to some papers by Bison's group, uh, in which uh, basically he was able to bind nuclei uh, by including the effects of the one pi and exchange potential, especially its second order iterate in the Schrodinger equation. And there are a few other effects that are smaller. But we, so we just took that model, uh, it gave reasonable properties for, for nuclear matter. And so we, we took that model and applied it to calculate uh, uh, charges, charge square radii. Uh, and in general, uh, you can get an equation uh, that looks like this. Let's say that P is a projection operator onto the Fermi C, Q projects above the Fermi C, and that's caused by short range correlations. And then uh, you get, uh, uh, when you calculate using the full wave function, you get something like uh, the matrix elements that you would have from mean field effects or low momentum effects. And then a correction uh, to uh, uh, a correction due to the fact that you have some probability that the uh, nucleons are above the Fermi C. And we uh, put in the dynamics of the, the, the old path and calculated the related G matrix. And so on, uh, the, I'm skipping entirely the calculational details. Uh, uh, you can look at them if you want, but I, I think qualitatively, the effect has to be there. And we estimated that, that uh, changes in mean square radii of FP shell orbitals were about one from the squared. So uh, now you might say one Fermi squared for an FP shell nucleus, the radius is about three and a half Fermi's and we square it at, and you call it 15, so maybe one part of 15, maybe one part of 20. <laughs> Usually uh, you say what nuclear physics, one part of 20 is, that's the, forget about it, it's good enough, who cares about a 5% effect? But the experimentalists now are getting incredible precision on measuring these radii. And uh, this demands that, that formally uh, small corrections uh, must be included and should not be neglected. Uh, our calculations are admittedly crude, but I think the order of magnitude estimates is okay. And the final uh, example is the role of short range correlations in beta decay. Uh, um, so there's a tremendous effort in, in the uh, beyond the standard model uh, community now uh, to try to uh, study, uh, especially super loud, <coughs> super loud beta decay to extract the VUD, the uh, Kobayashi, the down, up, up, down, port uh, matrix elements in the CKM uh, matrix. And uh, there have been many transitions that have been studied by Hardy and Towner, about 200 transitions. And as a result, they extract VUD uh, with this incredible precision, uh, 0.973, uh, plus, like this really scary, uh, scarily small error bar uh, for nuclear physics. Now, this is very important because VUD is very important to, uh, to test the, the uh, unitarity of the top row of uh, the CKM matrix element. And there's a lot of interest in uh, 
putting the limits of that and to see if there's actually any beyond the standard model effects anywhere. And uh, the particle beta group even had a smaller error bar. And uh, your point is that you're using nuclear physics and the standard formula for VUD squared, uh, which uh, supports the cross section. And there's some numbers in here, but, but there are various corrections that have been made. Uh, and I'm going to focus on one of them, which is the isospin break and correction. And super allow beta today, if uh, isospin is upheld uh, perfectly, then the beta decay matrix out of the, over, the wave function overlap, the dynamical part, uh, apart from the phase space, the part that's the nuclear matrix elements. If isospin is uh, it is upheld, uh, then the matrix element is just an isospin club storing coefficient to know exactly what it is. But the nuclei, there are Coulomb effects and other effects that violate isospin. And so there's an isospin breaking correction. And uh, basically, uh, from this formula, you can see to take the deviation caused by changes in, in, in uh, this correction that's called delta C, you get a simple relationship from first gear calculus. And uh, I take as an example this one particular uh, state that was used. Uh, one particular state that was used about a one percent effect, and if uh, if, if, if uh, let's say for example that there's a twenty percent reduction in that, that's 02 percent that corresponds to a change in the VU of 0 0.001, which is three and a half times the error bar, or eight times the other error bar from the particle data group. So uh, once again, uh, we, we have a situation in which uh, experimental and uh, precision demands uh, very, very high accuracy. And we have to look into more detail about the nuclear effects. So I'll say a little bit more about what is this delta C. Basically, uh, you have zero plus to zero plus decays. That's why only the isospin operator comes in. The matrix element, as I said, is known uh, as a pure isospin state. Uh, but if you take, for example, just the overlap of show model wave functions here, uh, you have a neutron proton transitioning into a neutron, and that's the wave function that I'm plotting versus R. Uh, and in blue, uh, the proton wave function is pushed out a little bit away from the nuclear center compared to the neutron wave function. In red, you take the overlap, the overlap is written as one minus omega and the quantity delta is twice that because we're squaring the matrix element. And uh, so this is the first and leading correction, but there are other corrections in more detail. This is just a pure shell model, single particle picture. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, great accuracy is needed now. And Tanner and Hardy are the ones who analyzed these 200 transitions. And they, uh, in fact, did not use the isospin operator, uh, uh, which is what the standard the model standard model tells you to use. They use another operator because they wanted to fit the calculation into their short, small shell model space. Their operator does not uh, obey isospin commutation relations. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, that's that's me along with Akeem Schwenk, uh pointed out the problem and tried to suggest a new formulation. Uh, that was largely ignored by everybody. Um, then, uh, more lately, there came to be these new experimental findings that I alluded to on the first slide. There was def definite evidence that there's short range correlations, which means that there were nucleons in high lying states in the shell model space, and you can't neglect those. And so I decided to uh, restudy uh, this question. And I made, uh, we made with an actually an undergraduate uh, student schematic estimate and found that the isospin correction was sensitive to short range correlations. It may be the isospin correction could be decreased by as much as 20%. Our, our calculation was very crude. So I'm, I'm not claiming uh, any definitive results. The actual amount of this 20% change depending on detailed models of the short distance behavior. Uh, and, and so uh, at that point, we just stopped and said, okay, this matters, but I don't know how much we need. Somebody should do maybe a real better calculation. So, so, so here, I got a question. So 
uh, Tanner and Hardy did use Isospin because they wanted to use their small show models. To, exactly. To, to, exactly. What, so what did they use? What, well, I, I don't reproduce their book. You can look at their paper or our paper. They have a, a funny operator. Just take their operator, take the, the tau x and the tau y and commute it and it doesn't give you tau z. It differs by uh, 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 one minus the overlap that I showed, one minus the square left and the overlap. So that, that's definitely true. And uh, that part uh, is beyond dispute. Uh, whether or not it was relevant, uh, Counter and Hardy said, uh, uh, well, that counter said that's part of the model. Already said we fit the data, so our, our, our model must be right. And uh, but, but is it is is the difference somehow second order in isospin or something? Well, all of the effects are second order in isospin. So you're talking about really small stuff. By the there's a theorem which in particle physics called the Adel, Adel Moro Gondor theorem. All these kinds of effects are second order. So we're talking about. Uh, if you like a second order effect in a second order term. However, if you're going to call error bars 0. 0.00031 or 0. 0.000014, then you have to start working harder. And uh, I, I, and, uh, I do believe that Town and Hardy work was the best possible work that you would do with 1970s nuclear physics. That's when they started. And uh, I think changes to the code were uh, small. Okay. Uh, and uh, so here's a summary of what I told you. Uh, the only thing I said is that high momentum transfer matters in low energy nuclear physics. High momentum transfer is related to short and relative distances. The basic features of the nucleon nucleon interaction stand out without any interpretation. And I give you uh, just three examples where this is relevant uh, the EMC effect, nuclear charge radii, and super loud beta decay. And in preparing for this talk, I noticed uh, that a review with pretty much the same uh, attitude was just published and I will put on the web in October. So I was pleased to see that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions. Um, you, you wrote down the uh, wind sound and the uh, energy. The first kind of like one over a the fourth power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it a single nuclear momentum distribution related to wind function squared? Is it just the wave function? Yeah, yeah, you have to square it. Yeah, then, then the, the, the tail goes down like one over a the eighth power. Right. Is that a kind of consistent with the overall reason? More or less. I mean, this is all very, this is obviously a crude toy model, but it just shows you have a power law behavior. Okay. Um, another question you saw the, the Maidan chain feature of the force, and you will talk about one fine change contribution to the kind of force. You also have the two fine chain or low chain. You have a feeling about the reality in order yeah. to one fine, two fine chain to the. You know, yeah, this is the uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, it comes from Visor's papers. Uh, I just picked out the dominant term. Did they include the row exchange and the two pion exchange? And those are much smaller. So I, I could have, you know, if I had given a whole talk on that, then I would have talked about that. It's, those are uh, less important. So that's why I focused on that. Okay. That's also the easiest thing to focus on. Questions? Zoom. Hey, Naftali, <laughs> old friend. So, so maybe I'll ask a question. So, so you can think of these short range correlations in terms of what pine exchange tensor forces and all that, but you can also think of it at the quark level. I was wondering if you had any insights into what's going on at the quark level. Yeah, uh, at the quark level, uh, there have been some papers uh, by uh, mainly Makaro Oka. Uh, you get at the quark level, one pion exchange is special because it's the longest range. So you don't really need any quarks. But as the two nucleons get closer, you have an effect uh, due to the quark Pauli principle, which acts as repulsion. Another effect that acts as repulsion is the one gluon exchange hyperfine interaction. And uh, Oka and his team uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, 
made a rather uh, good description of, of nuclear and nuclear scattering with those elements. The repulsion in short distance are uh, coming from yeah. Pauli and one gluon exchange. So from, from the, the, poly, the quark poly principle and the hydrofine, you can explain the tensor force, you can explain. Oh, the tensor force is dominated. There's a, the big tensor force at long range comes from one pi on. <laughs> And that comes when that comes almost when when the nucleons are separated. So that part you know is there. Sure. And then the, the other stuff you get the repulsion from the, uh, the vector exchange uh, in the one gluon exchange and the power principle. And they get uh, they might have thrown in a few other things too. But that's the basic. Thanks. Uh, Left Valley, did you have a question? Or? Yeah. I I want to comment just about this uh, problem uh, that uh, Hardy and Towner had and pointed out by Jerry and uh, Schwenk and so others. Uh, the, the mistake was that they have changed, you change in this process a neutron to a proton and you use the isospin formulas, but the new, in the calculation, the neutron is changed in, in, in a given orbit is changed into a proton on the same orbit, but equivalent orbit, but that orbit is distorted by the Coulomb interaction. So there is a mistake and this was pointed out and the, I think they have now corrected for it, but they have, in my opinion, some other problems there. And so uh, there's probably half a percent of still Mistaken view, the yeah, well, that would be huge. A half a percent is gigantic, uh, the gigantic effect. So, uh, so you are to be a lot of people would be happy to. I agree with what you said at the beginning, uh, as far as your statement isolating what their mistake was, uh, and they, uh, They didn't make the gross mistake about forgetting the fact that the overlap is not perfect. They at least have that, but, uh, in, but in more detail, uh, they falter. Just a side comment that the formalism of changing a neutron to a proton in its distorted orbit, it was uh, used by 50 years ago by McDonald and uh, McGeon. And they call it the analog spin and not the isospin. Yeah, you're right. They used, right, that's correct. They used, uh, I think Bill McDonald called it W spin. But, uh, but they didn't, I mean, the, uh, Hardin Towner did not look into that. And you were completely right when you pointed out, I think, that uh, there was a mistake. And they, but they tried to correct it, some effect. Right, yeah, and Azna Kali has written a paper uh, about that too. I didn't have time to talk about it. And there's been some others too. Um, uh, I, I think the problem is that when they started uh, their work, their really epical work with the 200 transitions, there was no standard model. So it wasn't so clear what to do, but now we, we know what people are telling us to do. It has to be high system. Thank you.